The answer is no. Before I get upset, before you say, oh no, he's just legalistic, I want you to hear me out. The first thing I want to ask you is why are you getting upset? Why are you immediately getting defensive? Because the Bible is very clear on this topic. It's not up for interpretation. It's not up there subjectfully. This is not a gray area or a gray issue. And the number one argument is, yeah, well, you don't understand my culture. You don't understand where I'm coming from. Frankly, I don't care where you're coming from. I don't care about your culture. Because there are Irish people that say, oh yeah, it's common over here. There's going to be people from Australia that say, oh yeah, it's common over here. There's people from France. Oh yeah, it's common over here. There's people in England. Oh yeah, it's common over here. America. Oh yeah, over here. Canada. Oh yeah, it's over here. Every single nation of the world can come up with their own standard. Every nation of the world can culturalize sin. Every nation of the world does not have their own standard for Christian living. There is only one standard, and that's through the lens of Scripture. And if you don't know who I am, my name is Andrew. I'm an evangelist here in Toronto, Canada, and I care about one thing, revival in the nations of the world. And I'm believing that you're going to be part of it in Jesus' mighty name. And with revival comes holiness. Holiness means to be separate, separate for God, separate for an exclusive use. And the Apostle Paul said this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. It says, In a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver, and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions, and the cheap ones are for everyday use. And verse 21, If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean, and you will be ready for the master to use you for every good work. There's a difference in people who God's going to use and who God is not going to use. And here the clear instruction, it was not God sovereignly and randomly picking. It's you put yourself in position to be used by God. And that's done by the way that you conduct your own life. The first thing I want to mention is when the Bible talks about alcohol, is it highlighted in the positive context or highlighted in the negative context? The Bible has no positive things when it comes to alcohol. Alcohol is a mocker. Alcohol is a deceiver. Alcohol will put you in rage. Alcohol will make you a laughing stuff. There is not one instance of scripture where alcohol or consuming alcohol is considered a good thing. Every single thing that's mentioned about alcohol is in the negative context. And speaking about alcohol, the alcohol from the Bible and the alcohol that we have today are two completely different things and are for two completely different uses. Alcohol in the Bible wasn't consumed straight like what we have here. The concentration of it wasn't as high as we have here. If you were to drink a beer, you'd have a beer about 5% alcohol. Wine is about like 14 to 15% alcohol. And shots that you're going to get here, whether it be of, of rye or bourbon or tequila or vodka, or gin is going to be about 45% alcohol. And you would have that straight. The wine in the Bible was number one, it was mixed with water at a three to one ratio, three parts water, one part alcohol. And it was about 2.2 to 2.75%. That's biblical wine. And the usage for wine in the Bible times was for medicinal reasons. The water that people would drink was regularly contaminated. There were parasites, different kinds of bacteria, E. coli that needed to be cleansed. So the fermentation of the alcohol was used to clean the water. This is why when you read, and this is something that people who justify themselves drinking alcohol use this passage. But yeah, doesn't the Bible say that you should have a little bit of alcohol? Does Yeah, doesn't the Bible say that you drink a little bit of wine? Well, the apostle Paul is telling Timothy that he should drink wine for his stomach, a medicinal use. That's what biblical wine was used for. It was used for medicinal purposes. And I want to stress that out, medicinal purposes. Alcohol today is not used for medicinal purposes. In our water, we have our own filtration system. Tap water is relatively safe. Alcohol today is drank for recreational purposes. Oh, it just helps me digest my food. Wrong. Wines are often paired with food for recreational purposes to quote unquote, enhance the flavor of your palate. So there's two distinctions from Bible alcohol to today's alcohol medicinal, recreational. So justifying alcohol today by using scripture is poor interpretation of what the Bible clearly states. Yeah, but didn't Jesus turn the water into wine? If you actually read the story in John chapter 2, what indication did you have where it was alcoholic wine? There are 10 Hebrew words for wine in the Bible, five in the Greek, and majority of them are non-alcoholic. And did you think Jesus would feed into somebody's sin? The Bible clearly states that no drunkard shall inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus did not come and help aid in people's sin. He came and exposed what sin was. What Jesus served at that banquet was non-alcoholic wine. 
It's funny because you have Christians today trying to justify alcohol and you have athletes, you have doctors, you have actors and actresses that are trying to advocate for not drinking, trying to not make it the social norm. Because if you look at the recent studies that science is now showing, you would see that there is no amount of alcohol that is actually beneficial for the body. This is a direct quote from the World Health Organization. This is what they said, that alcohol is a toxic, psychoactive, and dependence producing substance that has been classified as a group one carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer decades ago. This is the highest risk group, which also includes asbestos, radiation, and tobacco. There are no benefits, secular benefits, for even consuming alcohol. So how do we as believers justify them, not only to the world, but also to people in our church? Because as Christians, we're supposed to live at a higher standard. And if you're a minister, you are to receive double judgment, and you are called to live at an even higher standard. If people were to look at your life, would you cause people to fall into sin or cause them to stumble or cause them to relapse? And are you setting a good example by drinking? Oh, but only do it in the privacy of my own home. What about your children? What about your wife? What kind of a standard do you want to set? You know, even in the Bible, fermentation, which is what happens in wine, which causes it to become alcoholic, Anyways, fermentation was comparable to sin in the Bible. This is why kings, priests, and leaders were forbidden from drinking alcohol. The fermentation was comparable to sin. And this is why the Bible says that a little yeast spoils the entire bread, meaning that sin widely spreads into different areas and will completely consume the entire batch. This is why even in the communion, we have unleavened bread bread that is not contaminated. There is a standard that we are to live as Christians. And just like everything else in the Bible, God will not force you to do anything. You got to make that decision for your own. Or what is the limit for a Christian to drink? Zero. And if you're a leader, negative two. You can disagree with me, but just remember, I'm right. See you in the next video. Let me know what you think down in the comments.